Uh, hello, everyone. So today we have the pleasure of uh, hosting Yunyun Yunyu Ren from uh, Stanford. He's a PhD student in computational uh, mathematics uh, department, and uh, we will hear about the exciting topic of high dimensional density estimation with tensorizing flow. Thanks again for uh, your presentation, Yunyu. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the name. <laughs> Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ino Ren, and uh, I'm currently a PhD student at Stanford ICME. And uh, ICME stands for uh, the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering. Uh, so thanks again for inviting me to University of Montreal and Mila and this Tensor Network Reading Group. Uh, and it's my uh, great pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss uh, our previous work, a high dimensional density estimation with tensorizing flow with you guys. So this work is uh, collaborated with a uh, 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 supervisor, Lexing Ng, from math department uh, of Central University and uh, Hongli Zhao, Yu Hao Ku from department of Stats, uh, University of Chicago. So many of you may wonder what is uh, tensorizing flow, but before getting into that, I would like to uh, first give uh, a brief introduction on the problem settings and uh, some related topics. Um, yeah, so to begin, let's talk about uh, density estimation, this problem that uh, I'm working on. So the problem settings is uh, basically we are given n i d d dimensional samples. Um, drawn from a, an unknown distribution P star. And uh, we would like to construct another distribution P theta that uh, serves as an approximation to this P star, uh, where this uh, theta denotes the parameterization, whatever pr parameterization that you would like to use. And uh, so this distribution P theta, uh, must satisfy the following two criteria. So the first is that the PSP theta is required to be normalized. It means that it, it should integral to one. And uh, the secondly, uh, this P theta should be easy to sample from so that it is it will be used instead of the uh, true density P star. And uh, maybe uh, the most widely used uh, method for density estimation is called this the maximum likelihood estimation uh, is uh, quite classical. And um, if we write uh, uh, the uh, samples in the form of uh, empirical distribution like this, this PE, uh, then the um, uh, this MLD, MLE formulation can be written as uh, um, uh, by, 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 by uh, we, we could obtain the optimal theta by minimizing the KL divergence between the true density function P star and our approximation P theta, uh, which is uh, 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 equivalent to maximize the log likelihood of uh, the uh, empirical distribution. So I think that's uh, so far so good. And uh, so, Next, let's look at one of the most popular density estimation or generative models in machine learning or um, especially in the field of computer vision. So this is called the flow-based generative models. Uh, these models generally transform a, uh, so aim to transform a simple base distribution Q0 to a more challenging target distribution Q1. And, uh, the goal is to design a push forward F. So that maps the Q0 to Q1 that satisfies the following change of variable formula. And uh, in the flow based models, uh, the methodology is basically uh, to parameterize this push forward by a new network theta and then train with respect to the following loss. So this is this loss is just the MLE and uh, by by plugging in the uh, formula above. So, uh, the expectation is over Q one, but uh, in many cases we only have the samples, so it it is also approximated by the empirical distribution. 
And uh, obviously, samples of uh, flow-based generative models include normalizing flow. It's quite famous. And uh, with, uh, with also many famous architectures of normalizing flow, uh, to, to list a few, this nice, uh, with MAP, MA, MAF, uh, GLOW, and et cetera. And uh, so among all these flow-based generative models, I would like to specifically talk about uh, a this family of methods. So it is called continuous time flow models. Uh, so continuous time flow models <clears throat> regard uh, the push forward F as a result of flow that pushes the density um, QXT over time T uh, with initialization of uh, QX0 equal to the um, simple distribution uh, Q0X while preserving its total probability mass. So this method is largely motivated by uh, um, related topics, uh, related concepts uh, uh, from fluid me mechanics. And uh, so, so, so here I list some, uh, some concepts here. The first is the continuity equation. So as long as we are preserving uh, the total probability mass and uh, our transformation is um, continuous, then this continuity equation uh, is satisfied and uh, yeah, it is, it is a quite a powerful form to evolve the equation, uh, to, to evolve the, uh, the, the dynamics of uh, the probability mass. And the second is called the Brignier theorem. So uh, the Brignier theorem is, uh, answers the question of um, uh, which push forward F should we choose? Because obviously the push forward F is not unique. Uh, in order to transform one distribution Q0 to another distribution Q1. So this Brignier theorem uh, states that the optimal trans transport map uh, from Q0 to Q1 uh, in the sense of uh, minimizing the two Wasserstein distance is to choose the uh, velocity field as the gradient of a potential field. And uh, and here we will adopt uh, this theorem and uh, uh, assume that uh, our uh, velocity field is uh, the gradient of another potential function. So, and uh, the, the third concept that I would like to uh, talk about is, uh, uh, is the Lagrangian formulation uh, as opposed to the Eulerian uh, uh, Formulation. So, uh, the Eulerian uh, formulation, so also known as the density formulation, is uh, basically uh, governed by the continuity equation, and uh, the, uh, and instead, Lagrange Lagrangian formulation uses these uh, two ODEs to um, uh, describe the dynamics of the system, and uh, it focus uh, it focuses on the uh, dynamics of one possible uh, <clears throat> particle in the system. So it is particularly useful in the uh, training of the flow-based models, as we will see later. So below is an illustration of the mechanism of uh, the continu uh, continu continuous time flow models. So, uh, so, so, so first, uh, let's look at this blue path. So if we want to evaluate the density value uh, at a particular point x, then what we do is to let this x t, uh, x capital T equal to the point that we would like to evaluate. And then uh, use the inverse of this put forward f inverse to get this f zero. And in the, impl in the implementation, this F inverse is basically integrating the uh, ODE here. So it's a Lagrangian formulation uh, here. Uh, uh, so reversely, so, so that we can get F, uh, X zero from X T <clears throat> and then evaluate the uh, density value of uh, Q zero at uh, X zero. And then we integrate again uh, using the other ODE here uh, to get the uh, 
a value of QXTT, uh, which is uh, assumed to be close enough to the uh, density value of Q1 that we, that we would like to uh, estimate. And uh, if we look at this red path, so this is the sampling path. So if we want to sample from our uh, approximate density Q theta here, then uh, what we do is that we sample some points from the simple distribution Q0, and then we uh, again use this ODE to push that the samples sampled from this Q0 to samples um, hopefully <clears throat> in the Q1 distribution. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, and uh, so I, in this work, uh, okay, uh, are you, okay, sure. Sorry, I ahead. wanted to ask a question about the mm -hmm. previous slide, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. so the, I, I think I missed something. The assumption is uh, sampling from Q0 is uh, simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because in most cases, uh, this Q0 is just a multivariable uh, gauge. So okay. <clears throat> it's uh, quite easy to sample from Q0 and then push them to the Q1. Okay, thanks. Okay. And uh, yeah, so now that we are a tangent network reading group, so maybe I'll start time to reintroduce the tangent network to everyone. Uh, so in this work, we uh, focus on these tensor train representations. So uh, because we are working on the 1D case of density estimation, it's not 1D case, it's, um, it's uh, I, I, we will see this later. Uh, uh, so, so what we have to say here is that um, you know, not, not only the discrete uh, tensors can be represented by a tensor train, we can also uh, represent uh, d-dimensional functions uh, with uh, the so-called continuous tensor train representations. Um, so in this diagram, uh, diagramic notation below, uh, we can see here is um, uh, so, so so here in in the B in, in this figure B I use the the dashed lines uh, to uh, denote <clears throat> continuous variables and uh, use the uh, um, uh, <clears throat> regular lines to uh, denote the discrete connections and uh, here the alpha one alpha two to the alpha uh, d minus one. Uh, are called the bond dimensions or ranks. So it is uh, closely related to uh, the Schmidt decomposition, which we'll get into um, in a second in the algorithm uh, part of uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, so okay, I think I think mm, I think everyone is quite familiar with uh, this tensor chain representation, right? So uh, let's proceed. Um, yeah. So, okay, so far so good. Now let's settle down and uh, summarize the uh, advantages and uh, maybe some disadvantages of these two methods. So first of all, the flow-based models, uh, including the continuous time flow, uh, flow models, um, it is known to be quite flexible because, uh, the, uh, because of the use of neural networks. And uh, H, uh, ha, uh, so these, uh, these models have uh, presented strong performance on computer vision tasks as we know it. And, uh, but uh, it also has some uh, drawbacks. So the first is that it may have uh, a limited expressivity. So why is the case? Because uh, the Q0, uh, as we discussed before, is um, almost always uh, chosen as uh, a Gaussian. So the complexity of Q1 um, almost translates to the complexity of the push forward F. So in order to uh, uh, represent this uh, highly uh, complicated push forward F, it requires highly expressive functions to capture uh, the complex distribution Q1. So um, uh, but at the same time, it has a uh, high computational cost because it is intensive to evaluate the function f and its Jacobian uh, 
the determined uh, determined of a Strakovian here. Um, and uh, and uh, as we know, it's uh, the um, uh, so so this Jacobian is not that uh, straightforward to evaluate, and it may need uh, some uh, some very expensive uh, but yet uh, biased estimators. So maybe uh, including the Hutchinson's estimator. Uh, to uh, approximate this the determinant of Jacobian. Uh, uh, so because of this high computational cost, it really restricts the choice of neural networks that we can choose. So maybe in some sense, it also calls the limited expressivity. And uh, flow-based models also suffer from um, model collapse. So it means that it may struggle with multimodal distributions. Um, for example, the Gaussian mixture, because you have to split one Gaussian distribution to multiple Gaussians, so it is not that easy to do. And uh, okay, so now let's move on to talk about uh, uh, tensor, tensor chain representations. So uh, the tensor, tensor chain representations uh, are known to be computationally uh, efficient, and uh, it is very low cost because um, be, because it has a low rank structure. And uh, th these representations are more customized to the structures of densities um, if we know them in prior. Uh, for, so for example, it can deal with, uh, so, so the multimodality is not a problem for tensor chain representations. And um, if your density really has uh, a low rank uh, structure, then it is uh, it's going to be uh, fit uh, perfectly with the uh, tensor chain representations, and uh, so maybe not a low rank, and maybe it is it has a small spatial correlations. Then tensor uh, tensor chain representations would uh, uh, work very fun, uh, very good in in that situation, but um, yeah yeah. So the tensor chain representations also have these uh, uh, disadvantages, uh, disadvantages. So the first of all, the inflexibility, um, it is compared to the neural networks. So it's uh, quite limited in representing uh, complex distributions. Uh, and, uh, and also it is um, somehow difficult to train uh, because it is a highly non-convex optimization challenge. And uh, as I discussed before, uh, the tensor chain representations um, themselves are based on a strong endless. So uh, we must have a reduced spatial correlation. And uh, in order to represent continuous uh, functions, uh, uh, we, it also involves the truncation error if we are doing the polynomial expansion or something like that. Um, and uh, and the truncation error also arises from the assumptions on the bond dimensions. Uh, so, yeah, so how can we uh, synergize the strength of both, both models? Uh, this is why uh, we are proposing the tensorizing flow. So why is it called tensorizing flow? Um, let's come back to normalizing flow. Why is it called normalizing flow? It is because of the Q, Q0, uh, as you remember, the Q0 in the flow-based model <clears throat> uh, is almost Gaussian. So we are pushing a Q, uh, a, a, a more complicated uh, distribution Q1 to the Gaussian. So that is called the normalizing procedure. Uh, and in our tensorizing flow, instead of uh, pushing Q, a Q1 to, to, to a Gaussian, we push Q1 to a tensor chain representation. So we are basically tensorizing this distribution. That's why we are calling, calling it uh, uh, tensorizing flow. So here is a pipeline <clears throat> uh, of our method. So uh, from this empirical distribution PE, uh, in the first step, we construct the uh, approximate the tensor chain representation PTP uh, from from this uh, set of samples. And uh, in step two, we define a potential function parameterized by a neural network. 
and uh, in the continuous time flow model, we initialize uh, qx0 equal to this tensor train representation, and then develop a parameterized density q theta um, that we choose to uh, that we set it to be uh, the evolved uh, distribution at time capital T. And uh, finally, we train the neural network theta using this sample set. So, so these are uh, the same sample set. Uh, these are the same sample set uh, by minimizing the loss function here. So that's basically the MLE. Uh, there are some uh, uh, seeming, seemingly uh, uh, main advantages of uh, our uh, tensorizing flow. So the first is uh, it may present an enhanced expressivity because uh, uh, the tensor train uh, representation uh, effectively captures uh, the multimodality and uh, low rank structures of the target distribution. So it uh, may serve as a great start for uh, the subsequent flow model uh, is so that it may have a better expressivity, uh, as we will uh, show in the experimental part. And uh, secondly, it may uh, have uh, a better flexibility because uh, we are using a neural network based, based uh, um, continuous time flow model to refine the density estimation we obtained uh, in the first part uh, by um, using a tensor train representation. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, it uh, has the advantage of a reduced computational cost uh, because uh, <clears throat> uh, because the PTT, the tensor train representation already uh, is hopefully already uh, close to <clears throat> the target distribution. distribution. So uh, our uh, push forward this gradient of uh, phi theta here uh, is near identity, so that uh, it allows for a simpler neural network parameterization for this uh, flow, <clears throat> uh, which means that uh, we can use uh, uh, we can achieve the uh, <clears throat> equally good uh, results uh, using a. Uh, less packed neural network so that we have a, a reduced computational cost. Uh, yeah, so any questions so far? Sounds good. Uh, I do have a question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So I think I missed something that uh, why tensor train representation can capture multimodality well. Uh, so, Uh, well, it, it's a good question. Um, so I think we can think of uh, the tensor train representation as uh, an approximation to an arbitrary function. And uh, it basically uh, focuses uh, on the local structure of the density uh, function itself, but not uh, like uh, in the normalizing flow. Uh, it is um, the multi modality is split from uh, one single uh, probability mass. So, so, so because it is uh, approximating uh, uh, an arbitrary function, so uh, the structures of the target function will not affect the result of this tensor representation. So, in this sense, it is not. Uh, affected by multimodality as um, as much as uh, the normalizing flow does. So does that answer your question? Yes, I got some intuitions. Thanks. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm. Then let's uh, dive into the algorithms. So in the set step one, we are going to construct an approximate tensor train representation. But before that, let's uh, uh, first consider uh, an ideal case 
if, uh, in this case, we want to recover a uh, so-called finite rank and the Markovian density P here. So what is finite rank? Uh, its finite rank is just um, what I may um, <clears throat> mentioned before uh, in the uh, tensor strain representation slide. Uh, so the rank of uh, <clears throat> uh, of a function is um, defined here as follows. So we first <clears throat> uh, group uh, the variables of uh, this uh, density P into two groups and denoted by a semicolon here. So, <clears throat> so by using this semicolon, uh, we basically uh, regard this uh, function as uh, to have a structure of a matrix. And, uh, and if we uh, assume that uh, this uh, reshaped version of uh, density P uh, is a Hilbert Schmidt kernel, then it admits the following Schmidt decomposition. Uh, um, so uh, if we treat uh, the variable X as uh, discrete in indices, then this is just a fancy way to put for uh, the singular value decomposition uh, for uh, uh, continuous functions. And uh, uh, it, it might be surprising, but uh, Hilbert Schmidt kernel is uh, very, uh, it is not a very strong assumption uh, because actually any L2 integ integrable uh, function uh, forms a Hilbert Schmidt kernel. So uh, we are not assuming a very strong, uh, 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 strong thing here. Uh, and uh, what is Markovian? So the Markovian is just the density function P can be expressed in the following form. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so these two uh, properties, so this uh, finite rank property and the Markovian property are uh, basically extracted from the tensor representation here. So in, in, in the uh, diagram below. And uh, it is uh, quite straightforward to see that any tensor string representation uh, is final rank and is the Markovian. Uh, but uh, one may ask that, uh, okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just for the for the Markovian property, isn't it like mm -hmm. true for any distribution that you can factorize it this, this way? Isn't it just the chain rule for a probability distribution? Or am I missing something? Uh... Uh, I think there's some uh, uh, error here. So it's not uh, xd conditioned on x1 to d minus 1. So it is xd conditioned on xd minus 1. So... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would make sense. Yeah, that this would be more in line with the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. It's and... uh, maybe some error here. Okay, no worries. And and for the finite rank assumption, I missed mm -hmm. the last part that you said. You said it's not a, um, so much of a strong assumption because can you repeat the rationale you said like any l2 function as a schmidt decomposition uh, yeah yeah so uh let's assume that we have a function uh k x y then if this k x y is l2 integrable then uh a k x y uh as a as a kernel for uh as a kernel function uh the operator that it uh, induces is uh mm, uh, so 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 this kernel, uh, as a Hilbert Schmidt kernel. Uh, so 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 it, it will form a Hilbert Schmidt kernel, um, and uh, the operator that it induces will be a Hilbert Schmidt operator. Which means that it will be finite uh, which, rank. Uh, which means that you can do a singular value. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's similar to a singular value decomposition. So it's called the Schmidt decomposition to yeah. the uh, operator. So but, we can have but, the, uh, it's, it, 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 it's basically, uh, uh, it, it basically you can do uh, the singular value, uh, you can do the eigen decomposition to this kernel, if this okay. kernel yeah. is. Uh, so you can do the SVD, but you're, you're not guaranteed that it is 
uh, of final track, right? So maybe you will not uh, reach this equality. Uh, no, no, no. It's not guaranteed to be final rank, but uh, okay. uh, if uh, we have so so let's say you assume a c infinity property then it will have a, a very fast eigen decay something like that yeah then then you have yeah that makes sense okay, yeah so so thanks. that's why i'm calling it is a assumption so it's like we mm -hmm. have the final rank assumption here ah uh, yeah okay see. thanks okay uh yeah thank you uh and uh so the following theorem uh, answers the question of uh, if these two assumptions are sufficient uh, for being a tensor frame representation. So under the assumptions above, there must exist, exist a unique solution G1, G2 to GD. Uh, these are all functions uh, to the following system, the linear system of a uh, uh, so-called core deter determining uh, equations or, or the CDEs. And uh, Just as a reminder, the uh, the big phi one to big phi k here are uh, uh, formed by the first alpha k uh, singular values. So if you uh, if singular uh, <clears throat> this what it's called singular vectors, uh, so it, it it has appeared here, as you can see. So so it has appeared here. This phi k uh, multiplied by by this psi k. So, uh, so in this uh, C in these CDs, we 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 always assume that this uh, phi one and two phi k are a node, and uh, uh, and the variables here are the g one to g d, and uh, uh, and by solving. Uh, these uh, CDEs, we have uh, the following constraint uh, representation of uh, this uh, ideal uh, density function P. Uh, well, it is uh, uh, it can be easily seen by uh, directly plugging uh, the K's uh, equation to the K plus one's equation uh, uh, recursively. So it is uh, and. Uh, I will not give a um, uh, thorough uh, uh, proof here, but uh, it is quite straightforward. Uh, so by this theorem, we can see that uh, actually uh, by uh, the, these uh, two assumptions, namely the final rank and the Markovian assumptions, can guarantee an exact tensor frame representation here. But uh, so, so let's... Uh, <coughs> Uh, discuss more about this uh, the, this system of CDs. So first of all, the dimensions of these CDs uh, grows exponentially as uh, this uh, in this case. So suppose <clears throat> the variable x. So so each each x k uh, has n possible values. Then the case CDE requires uh, almost n to the k minus one equations here. So as you can see, it's the phi k minus one x one to k minus one. So that's n to the k minus one uh, uh, equations in just one uh, uh, CDE here. Uh, so it is not only uh, formidable to compute, but um, it, it is almost impossible to as estimate uh, these phi um, so so uh, these five with finite samples, it will have a much um, higher uh, variance and it may suffer from uh, curse of dim dimensionality. However, uh, this system of uh, uh, CDEs is actually overdetermined and it must be. So we can apply a so-called left sketching technique to um, reduce uh, this system of CDs to a reduced system to 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 <clears throat> to the following reduced form. So what we are doing here is uh, basically uh, left multiplying both sides with a wide matrix because the phi k minus one here is a very very thin matrix. So uh, if we multiply left multiply. Uh, by a wide matrix, it will have uh, it will result 
in a much better uh, <clears throat> condition to solve. Um, so let's see the diagram here. So uh, if we assume that uh, this uh, phi k minus one, so that's uh, the this red box and uh, the phi k, that's uh, this yellow box are known, then we uh, contract the phi k minus one to this uh, pretty determined uh, left sketching function s k minus one here. We will have uh, this blue box. So that's uh, what we define to be a k minus one. And then if we uh, contract this left sketching function s k minus one to the this um, phi k here, then it will result in the b k here. So uh, I know this uh, diagram is a little bit uh, too complicated, but uh, I think it, it's uh, more straightforward and more uh, clear than the functions above. Uh, and uh, the remaining part uh, in this yellow box here, so that is uh, the, the GK is the variables that we would like to solve uh, in this equation. So any questions to this diagram? Okay, uh, sounds good. So let's proceed. So and one obvious question is that how to select the left sketching functions. So ideally, uh, these left sketching functions should uh, uh, be chosen so that the row space of uh, this phi k, so this phi k here, uh, is retained so that uh, we do not uh, lose any information um, by doing this left sketching um, so that we can uh, have a an exact re this, uh, the recovery of this the, the core GK. Uh, it, it sounds really crazy, but uh, uh, actually it is actually possible by observing that uh, if we, we suppose uh, the density P is Markovian, then this P uh, here, and uh, so, so, so these two uh, reshaped forms uh, have the same co column space and uh, these two shaped uh, versions of uh, density have the same row space. Um, and just, just motivated by this, uh, these observations, we, uh, we just simply select the left sketching functions as k minus one to be the operation of uh, marginalizing out the first k minus one dimensions of uh, the corresponding uh, phi k minus one or phi k phi k. And then we, in the sec uh, second step, we form uh, this bk uh, with the first rk left single vectors of the three marginals pk here. So why this is the case? So, um, so uh, actually, uh, phi k is defined by the first uh, rk uh, left singular vectors uh, of uh, the density function p. E. Uh, and then we apply this sk minus 1 or the marginalization uh, to the phi, to, to phi k. But uh, here, we uh, <clears throat> actually, what we do is, uh, uh, in if we we do this uh, these operations in an implicit way, so firstly we apply s k minus one to mar mar marginalize out uh, x one to k minus one of the density function, and then we perform s v d to this three marginal to obtain this b k. Uh, because actually the first k minus minus two dimensions has. Uh, have no effect on the corresponding equation for GK uh, because of the Markovian assumption. So uh, by uh, after obtaining uh, uh, this this BK, we obtain AK by uh, marginalizing out the first dimension of BK. So this is the a this can be directly calculated from the definitions. Uh, 
so so in the the definitions here and uh, in the paper. So I have the following remarks of the algorithm here. Uh, the first is that this algorithm, although uh, motivated by the finite sample, uh, a finite rank and uh, Markovian assumption, uh, we can actually uh, obtain the exact tensor springing re representation of any ideal uh, finite rank and Markovian density sp, uh, thanks to the theorem uh, uh, before that I, I presented. And uh, notably, this algorithm only requires two or three marginals pk of this density p. And uh, this property turns out to be crucial for the density estimation when we only have access to samples. So as we will see later. Um, okay. Or oh, maybe I, I'm doing this quite some, somehow slow. Uh, so maybe let's speed up. So um, then let's finally consider a general case of, um, so, so in this case, we are going to approximate the targeted density P star, and this P star may not be final rank and may not be Markovian. Uh, so we have to adapt the algorithm aforementioned to, um, to this case. And uh, the first change that we make is uh, to construct a, a kernel density estimator, this PKS, uh, of the marginals, the, the real marginals, the PK star from sample. So why we are doing this? Uh, <clears throat> because performing uh, performing SVD to to the empirical distribution is very uh, is uh, uh, to the empirical distribution is very ill posed, and it may lead to severe Gibbs phenomenon when well, when doing series expansions uh, in the numerical approximation of uh, continuous functions. And uh, so that we must smooth this uh, empirical distribution PE uh, first and then do SVD. And, and uh, yes, one other thing that I want to mention is that we are actually doing this kernel density estimation to two or three marginals so that uh, we do not have a curse of dimensionality here. Uh, <clears throat> And if you uh, do the kernel density estimation to the whole distribution, distribution uh, it, it is, uh, that, that's a very bad idea. And the second change that we make is uh, we discretize uh, continuous dimensions by series expansion. Uh, and uh, the basics we use here is the normalized Laurent polynomials. And so that this I, the, the domain I here is uh, basically zero, uh, the minus one to one. And uh, this can be generalized to other domains uh, by rescaling. And uh, it may also be uh, generalized to the whole uh, real axis uh, <clears throat> by changing uh, to a, to, to, to maybe Hermite uh, basis. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this uh, numerical approximation is quite uh, ordinary. And uh, here is a di diagram of uh, uh, what we really solve here. So in this diagram, we assume that the a k minus one g k and b k are <clears throat> are known, and then uh, we also assume that. Uh, <clears throat> the inversion, uh, the, the 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 inversion of this numerical approximation is uh, accurate, so that we can solve instead. Uh, so we, we can instead solve the a k g k b k here. Uh, it's in the sans uh, serif uh, style. So these uh these discrete cores uh. So, so the equations involving these uh, discrete cores are just uh, uh, matrix equations so that we can solve uh, <clears throat> by programming. Uh, okay, so let's proceed. And uh, after obtaining the tensor train uh, representation or the approximate tensor train representation, because uh, we made many compromises before, uh, we are doing a subsequent continuous time flow. 
So re to add a reminder, uh, re reminder, I list the ODE uh, in the continuous time flow models here again. And the, for, for the potential function, we are using a four-layer uh, multi-layer uh, perceptual uh, initialized with the identity map for this uh, phi theta. And uh, the initial density is the approximate tensor strain representation. So it's just the Q0 is this uh, PTT. And uh, hopefully we will get a final density of uh, Q theta so that uh, it, it is a, an approximate of the real density P star. And uh, we train our uh, neural network uh, using this loss. So that's basically MLE loss. <clears throat> and uh, so for the implementation, uh, we <clears throat> uh, sample from the uh, empirical distribution uh, uh, and set it to be XT and uh, use uh, wrong, wrong Kuta uh, and uh, also our potential function to push it to <clears throat> this uh, X0 and then evaluate uh, using this tension uh, representation. And then again, use a uh, wrong Kuta uh, to evaluate uh, its value uh, uh, at uh, capital time T, uh, ca time capital T. Uh, and uh, do the back propagation to this QXTT. So any questions for uh, this slide? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Here, when you do the, the back prop, you do mm -hmm. it for the parameters of the MLP. Do you also do it for the approximate T representation or this part is fixed? Uh, it's fixed. It's fixed. And okay. uh, I think there is an ongoing work to generalize this framework so that the tense stream part is, uh, part is also optimizable. Yeah, right, because that could be interesting mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as I know, it's like, uh, if, if we would like to optimize over this tense frame representation, it may, uh, we, we, we must draw um, many other techniques to, to deal with the AO poseness. So, so something like that, uh, because uh, uh, mm, because we cannot update the whole tensor frame representation uh, at the same time, it uh, we we have to uh, update uh, one core by uh, core by core. So mm, yeah, I think that's uh, an ongoing work. So uh, yeah, and. Uh, Okay, I have 10 minutes left. Let's present some experiments. So the first experiment that I'm, I'm going to present is this called the Rosenbrock distribution. And uh, this Rosenbrock distribution is basically <clears throat> by modifying uh, the a very famous uh, pep, uh, test problem in optimization to this GIPS-like distribution. And uh, the parameters are listed here. And uh, the uh, characteristics of uh, this distribution is uh, it is um, isotropic in the first d minus two variables. It's almost isotropic in the first d minus two variables, while it is concentrated along a curve on the last two dimensions. So it presents uh, a singularity on the last two dimensions. So uh, this uh, experiment is used to test whether uh, test writing flow is able to capture singularities. So the results are quite uh, satisfactory. So the test writing flow here is basically the algorithm that I mentioned uh, before. And uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> the benchmark normalizing flow here um, adopts uh, the same uh, uh, architecture of the continuous time flow model that we use in the tensor writing flow as a fair comparison. So uh, as you can see, uh, the first of all, the normalizing flow starts um, from a loss of um, um, minus four uh, in the training loss here. So it basically means that uh, Gaussian is really not a, um, good initialization for the flow models. But uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so in contrast, 
the tensor plane representation uh, has a initial loss of minus 10 or so. Uh, so it, 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 it really gives a better initialization compared to uh, a, a Gaussian. And uh, with uh, the flow refinement, the tensorizing flow outperforms um, a normalizing flow in terms of um, both training loss and uh, both uh, initial and uh, final loss. And uh, here are some sample results. I think these are the uh, most interesting results here. So we are randomly sampling 200 samples uh, from the estimated densities, uh, both uh, the, is estimated by uh, normalizing flow, the tensor representation itself, and the tensorizing flow. So firstly, uh, tensorizing flow outperforms normalizing flow. Um, as it is obvious. And uh, second, so why does, so one may ask why Northern flow is performing this bad? So my answer is that uh, the uh, new network here is very small uh, and it may not be sufficiently enough. Uh, it, it may not be sufficient enough to learn the singularities of this distribution. And uh, I think the uh, another reason is that the sample size is uh, too small. Maybe it's too small for normalizing flow. So we'll see more about this <clears throat> at the ablation study. And, uh, and last thing is that uh, let's focus on this figure B and figure C uh, in uh, so, so below, so it's in this D minus one and D dimension. So as you can see, the tensor string representation can only uh, learn to the accuracy of the figure B here, but with uh, uh, the flow, the, the, the subsequent uh, flow model, we are able to push the density uh, towards the real uh, distributions. Uh, so this is really, uh, this really reflects um, the effectiveness. So, so how our tensor strain, uh, how, how, how our uh, uh, tensorizing flow works. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and notably, uh, there's no need for extra fine grids for the last two dimensions. So it is. Uh, so this is a really important technique used in uh, previous works, uh, previous tensor train uh, works. Uh, so they uh, had a uh, grade of like two thousand uh, for the last two dimensions, but here we only use uh, like a grade of uh, one hundred or so. So and uh, it is, uh, uh, <clears throat> and we are not using. Uh, a different grade for the last two dimensions uh, as uh, all the dimensions before. So that's uh, the generality of uh, our uh, algorithm. And uh, the other, uh, okay, let's just show some results. So, so here is uh, the the one D Ginsburg Langlau distribution, and this distribution, this, this distribution is basically has uh, it basically has a, an energy function of this form. And it is uh, a discretized version of the real ginsburg langdahl distribution, which is of the functional form. So uh, we are, um, due to time limitation, I will only present the following uh, ablation studies with this specific set of parameters. So uh, firstly, we uh, toggle the sample size n. So as you can see, the initial approximation tensor train uh, uh, representation improves as uh, this uh, the sample size increases, and uh, the tensor rising flow with um, ten to the fourth samples outperforms the, the normalizing flow of the same neural network architecture with the more samples. And uh, on the right is uh, a an ablation study of uh, different neural network architectures. So because um, you may wonder, so why? Why these normalizing? Why don't we make the normalizing flow as powerful as tensorizing flow by uh, increasing the neural network size, the size of the neural network? But uh, it turns out that if we uh, expand the uh, <clears throat> the size of the, the the neural network so that the tensor uh, normalizing flow, uh, the, the 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 training loss of normalizing flow uh, matches that of the normalizing uh, tensorizing flow, then 
uh, it will present uh, a uh, or the, the the overfitting phenomenon uh, significantly, as you can see on the right in this figure B, and uh, tensorizing flow with uh, ten to the fourth parameters out outperforms uh, the normal length flow with a much uh, larger neural network. So again, this is uh, this may because of the sample size is uh, too small for normalizing flow. I'm not saying that normalizing flow is uh, not powerful. It's just that it needs more samples to 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 learn. And uh, so here is also a two D Ginsburg Landau distribution example. And uh, the this this example uh, uh, also presents similar behaviors in learning curve. Uh, but uh, it shows the tensorizing flows uh, capability of uh, learning a complicated non-Markovian distribution. So as you can see, this is non-Markovian. And uh, okay, so let's proceed to discussions. So I would like to uh, mention another work by my collaborator, Yu Hao. So, <clears throat> so with a slightly change in methodology, so, uh, not slightly, it's like a, a small change in methodology, uh, uh, the tensorizing flow can also be used for a variational inference. And uh, the the two main differences uh, for uh, variational inference and the density estimation is uh, uh, the first is uh, we have to construct an approximate tensor stream representation uh, for this exponential minus ux. Uh, in which ux is the known energy function or potential. And secondly, uh, uh, we have to draw samples from this p theta ts instead of p star that we have here. So, so, so we are using the samples uh, to, con uh, to, to, to refine the uh, density. But here, you have to draw samples to refine your estimation, your, your variational inference. Uh, uh, approximation. And uh, here are some uh, experiment results. I think this is pre uh, pretty strong. Uh, so this figure basically shows that uh, you can uh, do variational inference om almost accurately for this Gaussian mixture distribution. Okay, so here are some takeaways for today's talk. So first, uh, tensorizing flow is first to combine the flexibility of neural network and the efficiency and robustness of potential representations. In step one, we apply left sketching and the current density estimation technique to construct an appropriate tensor frame representation. And uh, in step two, we adapt continuous time flow model and parameterize the flow with a simple um, neural network architecture. So in the experimental part, we, pre uh, we show that tensorizing flow achieves better sample and computational efficiency. And uh, it is less prone to overfitting, and uh, it is particularly effective for high dimensional or multimodal distributions, and possibly with singularities. So, for future work, maybe we can explore some uh, other uh, expansion bases to replace the continuous time flow with more powerful ones. Uh, and uh, we would also like to de uh, design more adaptive schemes for non Markovian models with uh, <clears throat> sophisticated graph structures. So here is a preliminary work by our group. So it uh, the, in this work uh, we discuss uh, we uh, uh, explore the the three tensor network uh, as you may know. So uh, these are the future works. And uh, any question here? So here are the, some references. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, if someone has any question, please. I have a general question. So, mm -hmm. okay. so like generally, if you want to, like, say which part is challenging in your in your proposed method, would you say like the tensor train estimation of a probability distribution is is a challenging part, like finding? Oh, uh, yeah. I I I would say that. Uh... The construction of this approximate tensor frame representation is the main difficulty here, uh, and uh, yeah. So as I, as I said, uh, this tensor frame representation should be first of all uh, close to the real uh, real density, but uh, at the same time it should allow 
the further refinement so that it should be somehow smooth. Or if it is too singular, it is uh, it is um, uh, it is uh, so in many in many cases, uh, you can achieve a a good KL divergence, but um, uh, but the density that uh, the, the the density approximation is uh, uh, <clears throat> not very nice. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it has some uh, it has some high frequency noises, that is not very desirable in the uh, uh, for serving as a initialization for the continuous time flow model because uh, it may present challenges of designing the potential function because it has to move uh, <clears throat> densities <clears throat> here and there. So, uh, so, um, so by doing the kernel density estimation here, uh, we are able to construct a reasonable tensoring representation that captures the low rank and uh, multimodal structures of density, uh, the, the target density. Uh, without uh, any uh, 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 <clears throat> challenges and issues that I mentioned before. So yeah, that's why I think this step one is the most challenging part. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I see a question in the chat. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, Ria. Uh, so by uh, near identity nature of tensorizing flow, I mean, uh, so in in normalizing flow or in the flow based models, we are pushing the density Q zero to another target density Q one. If we choose Q zero to be a multivariate Gaussian, then this push forward is uh, non trivial. It re it involves um, transforming a very simple or maybe the, the simplest distribution Gaussian to a uh, complicated distribution Q1. But here, uh, we are instead of uh, using the Q0 or the Gaussian as the base distribution, we are using the tense string uh, representation here, which is already very close to the target distribution. So the push forward here is uh, so so if so so let's put it this way. So if you uh, mm, so uh, even if you choose the push forward to be an identity map, uh, it will result in a, a reasonable uh, density estimation. Density estimation. So uh, hopefully. Uh, by using tensoring representation as the base distribution, uh, our flow model is is learning a near identity map. So that's what I call that uh, this the near identity nature of this tensorizing flow. Okay. I hope so. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think Sergio also uh, provided a reference for uh, graph structures and thank you i had a quick, a quick follow-up question like in the because so conceptually from a very high level perspective what you do is replacing q0 by a tensor train distribution basically your yeah 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 correctly right? Correct, correct. so did you try to compare that with other distribution like instead of using tt a tt representation of your distribution could you use I don't know, Gaussian mixture model or uh, uh, KD, or I don't know another, right? Because, but the idea is really to replace this, this uh, normal distribution that you use in classical uh, uh, normalizing flow with the, another model that is trained from the data. And here you propose to use tensor train, but could one use another form of uh, density estimation as the first step to, to instead of the tensor train? And, uh, yeah, yes, I think that's a, a good idea. And uh, so uh, you mentioned that we can use the Gaussian mixture as uh, the initialization. Uh, first of all, I think this 
is uh, already been explored by the CS community. And uh, the problem for this uh, initialization is that you have to know in prior that uh, the, 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 the approximate uh, locations of your distributions, right? Or, or it, it is, um, it, it's not obviously, it is not that clear whether it is beneficial to use a Gaussian mixture um, <clears throat> here and there. And uh, so you would, yeah. you would train it from data in the same way that you do for the tensor. So here your tensor trained representation, you learn it from your empirical data, right? Yeah. So you could do the same thing with the GMM, right? I'm not saying it will work better, but I think it would be interesting to to compare, right? The result yeah. is like yeah, to yeah. really show yeah, yeah, why is the tensor strain structure that, that must yeah, be here. Yes, and for uh, the kernel density estimation uh, that you said, you mentioned, uh, so 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 I think there is a, a curse of dimensionality problem for kernel density yeah. estimation as a whole. So I That's think the best point. idea is uh, what I do here is like we only do kernel density estimation to two or three marginals, and mm -hmm. using these marginals we construct a tensor uh, uh, representation. So I think the advantages of tensor representations are clear. And because uh, so so to name a few the uh, the computational efficiency, uh, uh, and uh, by constructing this uh, tensoring representation, it only takes about like five minutes. So, uh, with a relatively low cost, we can construct a um quite um satisfactory uh, approximation. Uh, I think that's uh, so. So in in this tensor frame representation, we can know uh, where the uh, densities are, and uh, and most importantly, uh, the tensor representation can deal with high dimensional densities yeah. because it uh, explores the low rank and uh, the Markovian structure of the densities. So so that uh, it only focuses uh, on the lo local uh, properties of density function. And uh, in, in many cases in, in the physical uh, research, uh, I think the densities are, are uh, really have these uh, properties, the Markovian and the finite rank. So maybe for example, the Harbor model, it only considers like local uh, <clears throat> connections. So yeah, uh, I think this is a, uh, interesting uh, direction to explore uh, more uh, <clears throat> interpretations <throat> for a flow-based model. And uh, yeah, well, our Thank work you. is just uh, shedding light on uh, the potential of combining uh, transferring representations to of and uh, the neural networks. Uh Thank you very much, both yeah. for questions and for the talk. If Perfect. there is no more questions, so yeah. And uh, thanks again for uh, your presentation in the Thanksgiving. Uh, and have a yeah, nice yeah. no day. problem. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, my my Thanksgiving starts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. See you.